Now, there, there's a lot of avoidance that goes along with this. Like on our example, you know, this guy, he's afraid of getting germs in public. So what does he do? He doesn't want to go to public, go into public anymore. He's afraid if he, if he does that, he's going to get exposed to the germs and he might die. Um, so there's a lot of avoidance, and that, that interferes with a lot of people's function to a significant degree. Now, um, there, have you guys heard of Tourette's syndrome? Have you heard of Tourette's syndrome? You guys probably have before. Interesting thing about that, and, and we, I got a whole bunch of stuff about it. We can talk. If we have time. I don't know if we will, but if we have time, we can talk some more about that. But it's basically a, a dysfunction in the brain in a certain pathway that causes the person to have uh, tics. And tics are sort of involuntary movements that just occur um, sort of out of the blue, you know, without the person being able to control it. And that can be anything from a, you know, like a vocal tic, like a <clears throat> kind of thing, or all the way to full words. You know, you've probably heard of, it's called coprolalia, but it's where people just curse, just right out, you know, like that. Not, not on purpose, I mean, it just happens, okay? And everybody's over here smiling, that's true. It's, it's sort of kind of funny, but I, I mean, in certain situations, it's not so funny because, uh, you know, I, as you can imagine, certain people wouldn't appreciate that so much. So, there's, if you think about it, there's part of the brain that's just kind of kicking off when it shouldn't in that, all right? You have a tick, you know, you might have a, a winking or a, some facial grimace or something like that, and it kicks off when it shouldn't, right? Think about obsessions for a second. That's kind of like a sort of a mental tick, right? Or a cognitive tick. It's, it's a thought. It's like a tick that just kick, boom, it kicks into your head and it won't go away. So it's really, if, if you think about it, you can see where they would be highly associated with each other. And sure enough, what's interesting is that with Tourette's syndrome or Tourette's disorder, uh, 35 to 50 percent of those people have OCD, have obsessive compulsive disorder. That's kind of wild. Almost 50 percent of them. Um, on the other hand, if you look at all the folks with obsessive compulsive disorder, only about five to seven percent of those folks have have Tourette's syndrome. So you can have OCD pretty commonly without having Tourette's, but having Tourette's is a pretty good risk factor for having OCD. So it's kind of interesting. Um, the other thing that's kind of neater is I think it's interesting, and it shows a little bit about how the brain works. Is that twenty to thirty people, twenty to thirty percent of people with OCD might have tics. It's not necessarily Tourette's syndrome. But it's some kind of some kind of tick, some kind of motor tick, or you know, facial grimace, or something along with with the, the obsessive, obsessions and emotions. So it's it's probably the same part of the brain as I guess the point, and that's kind of interesting to think about. We all sort of think about thoughts as being different and distinct from behaviors, but I don't think it's always that clear. So, yeah, here's a question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the ticks with obsessive compulsive disorder could come from the medication? That people take for obsessive compulsive disorder, or is that not a, is that a statistic without medication? Yeah, that's a statistic. The, the question is for the camera. The question is, um, uh, is the are the ticks that are is the twenty to thirty percent of folks with OCD that have ticks, is that related to the medicine that they're, they're taking, or is it related to some underlying illness, it, to, to some underlying problem in the brain? And it's more. It's the, the study was was with patients that showing that there's a problem with the brain, not with the medications. It's a good question because, you know, we had that talk about ADHD, and some of the medicines for ADHD um, can cause tics. I mean, they can increase tics. What we think is that the person already has some underlying problem with the brain, and then the, the, the stimulant medications is what it is, like Ritalin and, you know, Concerta and all these, it might bring out the tics. It's, I don't think that they would cause a tic necessarily. I mean, who knows, you know, maybe in some rare cases, but in somebody whose brain is absolutely normal to start with outside of the ADHD, you know, then you give them a stimulant, uh, not too many people will have the tick. I think it's usually people that have some other problem that's, that's causing it. And the thing is, you don't usually treat this with a stimulant. Usually it's a different kind of, we'll get into that in a second, what kind of medicines we use for these. But you wouldn't want to use a stimulant probably because it would make this illness worse. Any, any type of anxiety, if you use anything stimulating, even just caffeine, right? If you, had, if you have these thoughts that are bouncing in your head and you can't get rid of them, you don't want to, you don't want to increase anything. You don't want to speed your brain up. Right? You want to sort of slow it down a little bit if you can. So this probably would not be a good disorder to go using a stimulant in anyway. But um, the medicines we use for this, certainly it could potentially cause a tick, I would think, but not to that degree, not that commonly, you know? So it's, it's the illness. It's something, it's something similar in the brain, similar pathway in the brain. So if you could think for a second, what would that be? What, kind of, what would that part of the brain do? Um, I would assume that that part of the brain it has some function uh, to... Uh, inhibit, you guys know what that means, like to, to sort of squelch a certain response in the brain. So 
there, if you think about it, you have to be able to control when your arms move and when your face moves and things like that, right? You want to be able to control it. You don't want some, that stuff happening all on its own. So there has to be some way of inhibiting stuff from just firing, your nerve cells from just firing in the brain without you wanting them, wanting them to. So if there's something wrong with that, that, that part of the brain that puts the brakes on and says, okay, you're not going to move until I tell you, if you take, the, take, the, take your foot off the brake, all of a sudden now it starts to move or, or starts to do things, start to, starts to activate when you don't want it to. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little, a neat story of, in a second about how they, you know, sort of isolated the part of the brain that's responsible for this. It's kind of neat. Um, real quick, the presentation. Some of these illnesses are different in kids than they are in adults. And I'm, everybody knows in here, I'm not a child psychiatrist, but from my reading and everything, this presents this presents very much the same in kids as it does in adults. This illness does. And it's equal in men and women, or boys and girls. It's it's not different. Like with depression, it's twice as common. In, in women as it is in men, but this disorder is about the same. Um, usually, here's another kind of interesting fact. Um, it's usually slow in onset in, in childhood. So it's, you know, seven, eight, ten years old, the, the child starts to become, you know, gradually a little more obsessive, a little more obsessive. There's probably some problem going on in the brain at that point as the brain's developing. In some cases, it, kick, it kicks in rather suddenly, and uh, that's something, especially if it's a child, to really keep in mind. There is a, uh, there are some cases now reported where folks will have strep throat, kids will have strep throat, and the, strep, the streptococcus uh, bacteria, we think, is somehow damaging parts of the brain or something, and basically they get strep throat and then real quickly develop OCD after that. Now, the, the reason I tell you that is because you can treat that with antibiotics, and either, and I don't know about reversing it completely, but at least stop it in its tracks, you know, and preventing further <coughs> damage from, uh, uh, to the brain from the illness, from the infection. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you, anything we can prevent like that, it's, it's, it's pretty good because these illnesses otherwise, we can treat them, we can't cure them, we can't reverse them. Um, okay, so case outcome, here's our case. This, uh, this gentleman goes to see the psychiatrist um, and the psychiatrist refers him to a psychotherapist uh, and he works on exposure therapy, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, he also starts the patient on a serotonin medication, and both of the treatments uh, start to work gradually over time. It's not an immediate thing, but over the course of 10 to 12 weeks, this person improves quite a bit. Let's talk for a second about the psychotherapy. You might be thinking, you know, how would this is a brain problem? How would the psychotherapy? How would talking about it make any difference, right? We always I always hear that. I mean, I'm sure the psychotherapists in the audience they they hear this all the time. This is one disorder where we've got proof. We've actually got brain scan proof. The psychotherapy and medications work, and they work on the same part of the brain in the same way and to the same degree. It's, it's fascinating stuff. Let me tell you the story. Um, what they did was they took OCD patients that had fears of contamination, like we just talked about, and they put them in this scanner called a PET scanner. You guys heard of PET scanner? Some of the folks have. PET scanner is uh, it's, a, it's a type of brain scan where it looks at how the brain's functioning, not just taking a picture of like the, the, the structure of it, like a picture, you know. It's more, how is it functioning? So what part of the, and the way it works is how much energy is a certain part of the brain using, right? So if you scanned your body with this thing, your heart would be using a lot of energy, right? Because it's, it's pumping all the time. Your brain uses a lot of energy too. What you do is you put a person in this scan and then you have them do something, some task or have a certain thought, do a math problem, whatever, and you can see different parts of the brain light up as to where, what they're using. So they took these folks with OCD and they stuck a wet rag in their hand because remember now they're 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 kind of fearful of germs, right? They told them told them that this rag was dipped in toilet water. Now you can imagine what that did to their OCD, right? And we can laugh about it now. These poor people were probably pretty probably struggling at this time. But it, basically, the part of the brain that was responsible for their OCD just went boom, lit up bright red. It's the pre it's the it's the not the front very front part of the brain, but it's right behind that the prefrontal area we call it. So it lit up like crazy, right? Then they took these, these, all these patients, and, they, and one group got psychotherapy, and I'll tell you how they did it in a minute, and the other group got medication. I don't remember what it was, but a serotonin medicine, so like Luvox or Celexa or something like that. Um, and, then, and then after, and I forget the time now, it's been so long, but it's 8 to 10 weeks or 12 weeks, something like that, they put them back in the scanner, and they scanned them again to see what kind of difference it, it had made, you know, by doing the same thing, sticking the rag in their hand, telling them the same thing. Was there a difference? you know, in, in between therapy and medication and the, as to what happened to the brain. And exactly the same, and what happened was exactly the same uh, improvement 
was had by the folks on Medicaid, treated with medication and the folks with the psychotherapy. So what it shows is the psychotherapy actually worked um, on the same part of the brain to treat the illness as the medication.